On the western slope of the Rocky Mountains in Canada, the historic town of Waldo, British Columbia, is put to the torch by the B.C. government to make way for floodwaters rising behind an American dam. We were required to perform this act to fulfill our obligations under the terms of the Columbia River Treaty. September the 16th, 1964, near the Peace Arch Monument on the Canadian border at Blaine, Washington. Politicians from both countries stage an historic meeting to mark the biggest international resources deal Canada has ever made. Ten years later, there is still argument over the terms and costs. This was the best international commercial agreement that Canada ever made. The Columbia River Treaty has been a disaster. Not a bad deal. It could have been some, somewhat better. It was part of the drive by the United States to gain control of one of our energy sources. We've been willing to give up our birthright in this country. And uh, as it turns out, generally for damn little. It's the fairest deal that could have been negotiated at the time under the conditions which were present. We got a very bad deal. The deal was made has proven to be an advantage to British Columbia. If that treaty was to be negotiated today, Canada and British Columbia would never stand for the deal that we uh, concluded with the Americans. The Columbia River rises in Canada and reaches the sea in the United States. For decades, this river has symbolized power. The Columbia and its hundreds of tributaries make it the biggest Pacific Slope River in North America, providing one-third of all U.S. hydro production. For its first 200 miles, the Columbia flows north in the Rocky Mountain Trench. At the Big Bend, it swings south and down past the town of Revelstoke. For 100 miles, it flattens out to form Upper and Lower Arrow Lake, and at Castlegar, the mountains close in again. The Kootenai River flows down the Rocky Mountain Trench, passing within a mile of the Columbia at Columbia Lake. It runs into the state of Montana, and near the town of Libby, turns north to re-enter Canada and lose itself in Kootenay Lake. The Duncan River flows into the north end of Kootenay Lake, and together with the waters of the Kootenay River, runs out the west arm to join the Columbia at Castlegar. Then the Columbia passes into the United States, below the smelter town of Trail. In the late 1950s, there were only five small dams on the Columbia system in Canada, but the Americans had built more than 100 dams on the Columbia and its tributaries on their side of the border. Eleven of the biggest dams were on the main stem of the river, and more than half their water supply came from Canada, but most of this ran down in the flood season of May, June, and July. The Columbia River Treaty called for three dams in Canada to hold back the floodwaters, release them gradually through the year to drive American generators downstream. First and smallest of the treaty projects was the Duncan Dam. It stores 1.4 million acre feet of water in the Duncan River Valley. An acre foot is a quantity of water one acre in area and one foot deep. The Duncan Dam was completed in 1967. In 1968, the Keenly side or Arrow Dam was completed just upstream from Castlegar. It raised the level of the Arrow Lakes to provide 7.1 million acre feet of storage. At Mica Creek on the Big Bend of the Columbia, the Mica Dam began trapping water in the spring of 1973. This is the biggest of the dams and will store more than 11 million acre feet of water. The treaty also provided for the Libby Dam in the United States on the Kootenai River in Montana. Its reservoir backs up across the border and floods 42 miles into Canada. By the mid-50s, the Americans had decided that Canadian sections of the Columbia must be harnessed for power development and flood control as well. In 1948, 35 people died in a great flood. Without protection from high water, 
the Americans felt threatened on the vast floodplain of the lower Columbia. This is General A.G.L. McNaughton, a dedicated nationalist. He headed the Canadian section of the International Joint Commission to whom the Americans took their plans for harnessing the Columbia. In 1958, Americans were bargaining hard to obtain water storage in Canada at the cheapest possible price. On a tour of the Columbia River Basin, the old general jolted the Americans by suggesting that we might divert the Columbia River into the Fraser and get full power benefit ourselves. This would give them flood control and no power. I'm perfectly frank about it because I think the time has come to be frank with, uh, with all concerned in these matters. We have alternatives. It is open to us to a very considerable extent to take these waters through the Monarchy Mountains and into the Fraser River and to use them to generate something over 3 million kilowatts in the Fraser close into our market, which is a very important consideration. That is Grand Coulee. This is General Emerson Ishner, head of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He told a committee of the U.S. Senate that the Fraser diversion would cost the Americans $50 million a year. kilowatt hours of primary energy annually. I've heard both sides of this. I've heard some lawyers argue that Canada has the right to divert. I've heard others say that we could take Canada into the world court if she does divert. Uh, the only thing I know is that the possession is nine points of the law, and if Canada diverts and goes ahead and does it, it's obvious we wouldn't use military force to prevent Canada from doing it. It might be a very long, stubborn, slow judicial process to ever get it reversed. I'm of a realist to know that. The Americans conceded the point to McNaughton and agreed that we should get half of any increase in U.S. power generated by Canadian storage. Now it was up to the diplomats and politicians to talk about price. Prime Minister Diefenbaker set up a negotiating team, but McNaughton was left off it. Many people were incensed at McNaughton's exclusion from the talks but he would have been an abrasive influence in the negotiations because of his hard stand on Canadian rights. Still, he would not be silenced, and so he stumped the country with a plan of his own. The essence of McNaughton's plan was sovereignty, control of Canadian rivers by Canadians. Rather than have the Americans control the Kootenai River with a dam in Montana, he had proposed to block the Kootenai just north of the border and to reverse its flow back into the Columbia. The McNaughton plan was attacked because it cost more than the alternatives. But a more serious flaw was the enormous environmental damage it would have caused here in the East Kootenai Valley. 87,000 acres of the finest big game range in North America would have gone underwater. Had the general prevailed, we'd still be in control of the Kootenai and Columbia, but the price was too high for the BC government, and it vetoed a federal government proposal to flood this valley. McNaughton had made his point on nationalism, but the Americans were giving up nothing else. Differences also emerged between B.C. and Ottawa. Talks dragged on through the summer of 1960 and an American presidential election campaign. Washington, D.C., January the 17th, 1961. Three days before President Eisenhower left office. Prime Minister Diefenbaker gained a place in history by signing the Columbia River Treaty, an agreement of enormous significance to this country. The deal had been concluded hastily, many contend too hastily, in the middle of an American election. Ahead lay a host of unknowns. It looked like a good deal to most people. And uh, I wouldn't draw any other inference. It just looked good enough to be something that Mr. Baker wanted to put in the window. And uh, so there was going to be another federal election uh, shortly. All right, he, uh, he thought he had something that was good. The Americans, uh, before the end of Eisenhower's regime, were, were pressuring the signing of a treaty so that they could use it for uh, political purposes. And so they got the, the essence of that treaty out, as you'll recall, back in October sometime, uh, so that they used that during that uh, presidential campaign. The Sternwheeler Minto, a symbol of the peaceful and leisurely way of life, 
along the Arrow Lakes in British Columbia. In these mountain valleys where the great change would soon occur, international negotiations seemed remote from the realities of traditional lifestyle. The change was imposed from afar by people of another world. Seeing their fate discussed by international negotiators whom they did not know and could not reach, the valley residents of the Columbia River were helpless to plead their own case. With their whole future at stake, they placed their trust in the politicians, believing that the system would protect their rights, that they would receive justice. I think we can trust our, our politicians at, at uh, Victoria and in Ottawa. The residents of the Arrow Lakes feel that the battle will never be lost until the water comes right over their properties and dooms them to elimination. If somebody could kill me off and the land would still be safe, I would very willingly uh, finish my earthly days. To residents of the valley towns like Nakusp, American ratification of the treaty came with a jarring suddenness. Then hope revived briefly when B.C. and Ottawa fell out over terms. Canadian water would be used to generate power in the United States. The Americans had agreed that we were entitled to half these downstream benefits. Premier Bennett wanted cash in advance for them. The federal negotiator, Davy Fulton, said we should take the power instead. We're no longer in a position where we should be to continue to be dependent upon fish and wood with their seasonal fluctuations in employment. What we need is industry with job security, year-round job security. And you only get this if you have power, which are the sinews of industry. And this was the whole objective of this treaty, was to get an arrangement under which we get power back and we, that we accomplished under the treaty. Now, this is not export power. This is power that's being developed and generated in the United States. And if we bring it back home, it's like bringing coals back to Newcastle because we get 30 million horsepower to develop and create a lot more employment and industry if we do it. Now, we sell our share to the United States that until we need it at five mills at this double price. For months, the battle raged. Whether we would get power from the Americans in return for building dams in Canada or whether we would get cash instead. Finally, in two brilliant strokes of power politics, Bennett broke the impasse and brought Ottawa to heel. He nationalized the province's biggest power company and announced a giant hydro development on the Peace River. This is the most momentous announcement I have ever made. When undertaken, this project will result in the development of some four million horsepower for the further industrial and commercial development of our province. So the BC government astutely moved into a position of being able to veto completely the treaty. So Premier Bennett and the B.C. government, B.C. Hydro, the engineers advising both the B.C. government and B.C. Hydro, were in a position to extract almost any price. They were in command of the situation. And Mr. Diefenbaker really was unwise to conclude a treaty without having locked in the province, certainly a province that controlled the utility which would sell the power. This was Bennett's famous Two River policy. He turned his back on the Columbia dispute and work plunged ahead on the peace. With power from the Peace River, he didn't need the Columbia, but Ottawa could not complete the treaty until an agreement had been reached with the province. Finally, to the weakened minority government, Prime Minister Diefenbaker capitulated and Bennett got his way. Our share of the Columbia power was to be sold down the river. On the eve of his election in April of 1963, Lester Pearson said the treaty would be renegotiated if he formed a government. Two years had passed since the signing of the treaty, and it was apparent there was lots wrong with it. A history, a common commitment to freedom, and a common hope for the future. And it is my strong... Within a month of his election, the new Prime Minister met John Kennedy, the new president, in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. When the meeting was over, the Columbia deal still stood. And so also did the commitment to establish Bomark missile sites in Canada. Context of world peace and better relations between all peoples and we will be 
discussing problems of special interest to our two countries. We could have refused to implement the treaty, which was a binding treaty, but this wasn't the kind of thing that Mike Pearson was likely to do. Uh, he was more likely to honor a treaty, as he did with the Boer. Jack Davis uh, had spoken against the treaty. He'd spoken for it, but he'd also spoken against it. Uh, he came out with an alternative himself in the, in the series of articles in the Vancouver Sun just before the 63 election. Uh, so these were known, but there was this political commitment we were talking about, and uh, it made it an irrelevant exercise. The people in the threatened valleys in British Columbia had placed a lot of hope in Pearson. But while the treaty was patched up a little and financial conditions improved, the guts of the deal were to stand. The dams were going in. The valley people had been bypassed by the political process. They had not been consulted, but their way of life was doomed. The bleak prospects for the river people were not in any way reflected by the triumphant headlines splashed across the pages of the big city press. It's only by making the Americans uh, pay for our dams, uh, three of our dams in, in British Columbia, that makes the Columbia feasible and, and low price power. But developed by itself, it would be way more expensive than the fee. Now, this is great for Canada and great for British Columbia. This is no sellout. This is a genuine good business deal. President Johnson signs the check in a ceremony at Blaine, Washington. Premier Bennett had gotten his way. He had sold our share of the new power for cash. We got a lump sum payment, and for 30 years, we would get nothing more. It looked like an awful lot of money at the time, but it locked us in. We had made an enormous commitment. To build the three dams, the Americans were giving us more money than anyone thought they would ever pay. With interest, it was expected to come to 500 million. This was to pay for all three dams plus half the generators at MICA. Premier Bennett's reputation as a financial wizard seemed enhanced by the deal at first, but as time went on, some flaws emerged. That five mills would not only pay all the financing on the three dams, but would pay for two million horsepower generation at MICA in, on the BC side. So the United States would be paying three mil for treaty power, and we would get two million horsepower absolutely free. We were told by the previous premier that uh, the uh, power from MICA would be free. Uh, the expression he used at the time he announced that, he said, nothing is freer than free, my friends, and I quote. When the government changed in 1972, the awful truth came down. The new government of Premier Barrett found that the money we were paid under the treaty was nowhere near enough to do the job. The Duncan Dam was completed in 1967 before construction costs began to soar. Its cost was very close to the estimates and it earned a $4 million bonus for early completion. In 1960, when our negotiators included the Keenly side dam in the treaty, they thought it would cost about 66 million. By the time the treaty was ratified in 1964, the estimate had jumped to 129 million. The final cost in 1969 was three times the original estimate. At MICA dam site, the generators are not yet installed, but the BC government is projecting an overrun of $262 million for the dam and half the generators. Some of this can be attributed to a 25% hike in generating capacity. In total, the three dams, half MICA's generators, and clearing the Libby Basin will cost $329 million more than all the revenues we received under the treaty. We're such a wealthy province, relatively speaking, that we're able to pay off that huge amount out of, uh, out of our own funds here in the province of British Columbia. If that had happened in a poor area, it would have broke the province. We went through a series of school construction freezes. We had ministers in the former government say children didn't need gymnasiums, that they could exercise in the classroom, and, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, hospital construction suffered. Uh, we, we bore the cost. There were also enormous related costs that the public had to pay, 
improved highway systems, new bridges, railway relocation, plus social costs like welfare increases that had not been provided for. It's taken now a pretty two weeks to take in what we used to take in a day. So if that hasn't killed me, what has? You were bypassed. We were bypassed here, and according to some of them, that we should have been compensated and never was. Nobody had even come around to see us. So it's left us high and dry. The only thing left now is welfare. They pay good money. The government agencies tried to ease the pain. They built two model towns on the Arrow Lakes to relocate people displaced by the flooding. They found also that costs of clearing the reservoir areas were far higher than had been anticipated. In order to complete these tasks, funds had to be directed from other departments. By 1967, the Bennett government was trying frantically to cover the costs. In the BC Hydro building, a secret committee was put together to unload costs onto other departments. Highways, Forest Service, and others were to be tapped for funds and the public knew nothing about it. The Forest Service bore a chunk of the cost of, of clearing the Arrow Reservoir, some $5 million out of a total of $13 million for clearing Arrow. The Water Resources Service of my department uh, picked up the tab of $19 million for clearing the uh, Libby Pondage area. Uh, so the, the numbers are there, and uh, and they were somewhat varied in departmental costs. At Grand Coulee Dam, the Americans are adding a third powerhouse to use the water stored in Canada. The power sales for 30 years at 4.6 mils. Power is worth more than double that now, but we are stuck with the deal because the Bennett government insisted on a lump sum payment instead. The sale doesn't end until the year 2003. The result of it is that we are going to be providing a service to the United States uh, much cheaper than any alternative that can be provided, and they will come to depend upon us. Certainly things have changed, but uh, I'm confident that the conditions that existed and the, and the way we put the money to work at that time, that the people have got full benefit from the arrangement. Domestic power rates are overpriced at this moment in, in competitive terms with other areas of Canada. They're overpriced, but they're overpriced because, again, of, of the previous administration's decisions on selling that downstream power to the United States. I think it's conceivable that uh, if uh, everybody had known what was going to happen to cost, uh, that we would have held out uh, for something more there. But uh, you have to remember that this was a, an agreement. It wasn't something that we could impose. You could wipe the slate clean and start over again. Of course, uh, we would argue that those kilowatt hours had a higher benefit today. But, but if you want payment in advance, as the British Columbia government did at that time, you had to accept a negotiated settlement based on the best judgment at that time. Had we uh, retained the downstream benefits, uh, we wouldn't have to contemplate power projects in other locations. We wouldn't have had to contemplate more costly alternatives. Wouldn't have had to look at uh, the use of coal or thermal energy, or even as some say, uh, nuclear energy. In front of the Grand Coulee Dam is a counter which tallies up the value of generated energy. As time passes, and the Americans make more efficient use of Canadian water storage, this counter will pick up speed, but there's less and less in it for us. For the downstream benefits diminish as the treaty ages. Long before it expires in the year 2024, our share will have dwindled to almost nothing. The Americans did things with this power, which we could have done had we not sold it. In 1960, for example, Columbia Power produced half a million tons of aluminum on the U.S. side. Treaty Power had raised this production three times by 1974, and we hurt our own aluminum industry by the competition this deal made possible. In effect, we exported 11,000 jobs in the aluminum industry alone. Now, as we seek to expand our own economy, we must consider damming other river systems, 
to replace a power option that was actually ours in the first place. You don't build dams for power generation only. Flood control is another function of dam projects. We were paid for this flood control, but again, in a lump sum payment, $69 million. It was worth much more. Secure in the knowledge that they have bought and paid for protection behind Canadian dams, the Americans have exploded industrial development on the floodplain of the lower Columbia. They now estimate that in 1972 alone, that one year, the value of our flood control was equal to what we were paid forever. The Americans, in fact, uh, I've now found out through checking the documents, and that's not been made public generally, uh, were prepared to pay half the value of flood prevention in the United States annually. Well, I, I think somebody just made a, a flat mistake. They you know, they, they divided the flood control benefits in half. And I could never figure out from the first why they divided them in half. We don't get anything. You know, in power, the Americans have to generate the power, deliver the power, put in the installations, and then send it back. But insofar as we're concerned in Canada, you know, they don't have to do a thing. They just get benefits. Why don't they pay for the benefits? The answer is very simple. Because in our treaty arrangements, we did not require them to. Our negotiators feared the Americans would build their own dams if we ask too much. The Americans had some other alternative rivers to dams, but they were costly alternatives. There were problems of private land, roads, beauty spots, and valuable wildlife habitat. They certainly uh, underestimated the, uh, the weakness of the American bargaining position in going into the treaty negotiations. In the mid-50s, Dr. Marion Martz of the University of Washington made a study of the American alternatives. Something in the order of uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 big reservoirs, depending on how you count them, for a total of something in the order of 30 to 35 million acre feet, had been foregone, precluded from development within the U.S. side of the Columbia Basin for reasons of fish and Indian lands and uh, railroads, highways, communities, scenery, national parks, and so forth. July, 1966. General McNaughton is buried in Ottawa with full military honors. History has proven him right about Canadian sovereignty and the dangers of quick buck thinking. Before he died, he summed up the losses in the treaty. Due, he said, to the complacency of Fulton, the vanity, ignorance, and carelessness of Diefenbaker, and the stupidity of Bennett.